Amen. Hey, take your Bibles and make your way to John chapter 2 as we continue this series called Epic. Let me just remind you, the whole point of this series is to sort of look at these epic moments, some of the very many epic moments that are leading up to what Jesus is going to do at the Last Supper. What Jesus is going to do at the Last Supper is he's going to introduce a new covenant with all of those who would follow him as their Lord and Savior. And all of these events that we've been talking about are leading up to that. If you'll remember, we looked at sort of the beginning of things. How did mankind sort of shape out after the fall, and we saw that mankind, they weren't doing so well. Uh, As a matter of fact, the scripture teaches us that, that the thoughts of man were evil all of the time. And if you'll remember, God saw a man named Noah who was righteous as it compared to his contemporaries. Noah was not a perfect person by, by any means, but he was righteous when it came to comparing him to his contemporaries. And so he had his faith in God, and God gave him a task which seemed a little out there, a a task that really didn't seem to to make sense, but Noah was obedient to build that ark, and that ark became the saving vessel for he and his family, all for the purpose of God's plan to redeem mankind back to himself. And so God floods the earth. Noah and his family are spared. God makes a promise never to do it that way again, and that promise has been kept. And then there's this sacrifice. We get into Abraham and to Isaac, and we see Abraham's obedience once again pointing towards God's plan for redemption. Abraham wanted a son. God had promised him a son. Uh, Abraham was not perfect either. And so Abraham sort of took his life in his own hands and his own plans in his own hands and made some weird decisions and, and really didn't put trust in God in those moments. But God came through and God gave he and his wife a son, and then God asked him to do the unthinkable. He asked him to do something that just didn't seem to make sense, which is, hey, sacrifice your only son, and he does that. He takes him up to the mount as God pointed and gave directions to it, and he was obedient to do it, and then God came through what was the point of all of that, pointing towards God's plan for redemption, pointing towards God's plan to redeem mankind back to himself, to not do the reset that he did at Noah's Ark. And then we continued on, and then Scott taught on the Exodus and the law and how God regulated the behavior of mankind. But the big point of the law was to reveal just how how sinful we were and how, how we needed to be regulated as people, as human beings. And the law shows our need for a Savior. The law could not do what Christ only can do, which is to redeem us. And so the whole point of that is not just to regulate man's behavior, but to reveal our sinfulness, to reveal these natural inclinations that we have to lie, to steal, to murder, even physically and in our hearts. And we have these natural sinful inclinations to just disobey God, these natural inclinations to treat each other terribly. It's who we are, and it's what we're born into. It's an imputed unrighteousness passed down all the way uh, from Adam. Adam's sin in Genesis chapter 3 fractured the DNA of mankind. We no longer think about God. We have to be wooed by God into a relationship with him, and it begins with him. And then last week we looked at the story of Jonah. And if you've read that story, and I'm sure you have, uh, this is a type of resurrection. The story of Jonah is pointing us towards the work of Christ. Jonah is not Jesus. He's a type of Christ. The work that happens in the story of Jonah, one, is to show what happens to a person when he disobeys God. It never goes well for us when we disobey God. If you'll remember, I didn't promise that you'll be swallowed up by a fish. I just said it could happen, right? And you don't want to get swallowed up by a fish in Arkansas because that's going to be a nasty fish, definitely worse than a whale. But our disobedience has consequences. But even bigger than that, what we saw is how God longs to be gracious to people. How God God wants to save anybody and everybody regardless of who they are and what their background is. The Ninevites were a group of people that were just a deplorable group of people. They were an evil group of people, and God wanted, to, God wanted to save them. And he wanted to send Jonah to do it. 
And Jonah didn't want to do it, but then he did. And then he complained about it and so on and so forth. Go back and read about it. But it is a story about God's goodness, his graciousness, and it points us to the work that Christ is going to do as our Lord and Savior. And so today we're going to continue and we're going to look at the very first miracle Jesus ever performed. And the reason we're going to look at this miracle is this is the moment where Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah. This is this moment, this very first miracle where a supernatural occurrence happens for the purposes of revealing who he is. And we're going to unpack this story. And of course, this is recorded in John's Gospel, the second chapter of John's Gospel. Now, I'll have to admit, I've never preached on this story before. Um, I started to kind of think about why have I never preached on this story and uh, maybe a little nervous to do so. I mean, this is a story that's going to mention a few things. You know, Baptists get a little squirmy when you start to talk about specific topics. Uh, Baptists get a little squirmy when you start to talk about things like money, right? I saw several of you grab your wallet real quick. There's something about money. I mean, you start talking about money, people get a little a, l- a, little, a little squirrely, a little, little squirmy, a little, little nervous. Like, what's the whole point here? If you're, a, if you're a longtime Baptist, when money comes up, you think, oh, goodness, they want more, right? If you're not and you're, it's your first time in church and somebody starts preaching about money, you might even respond with, oh, see, all they want is our money, right? We just get this little squirminess when it comes to money. Another topic is sex. Me even saying that word right now, some of you went, huh? Like, it's just weird even saying the word in church. So just look at your name. No, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Some of you are going to write me a letter and go, uh, Pastor, my whole goal is to preach today and still have a job. And so I think I've got, you know, 50-50 shot here. Another thing is the topic of alcohol. There's just something weird about talking about that. And I think for me, it's, it's maybe just how we were raised, raised in sort of a more legalistic society when it comes to our relationship with that issue, some of the cultural things that come along with that, some valid, some not so valid. But it's sort of a strange thing for Baptists to have a conversation about a touchy subject like that. Because as Baptists, we sort of like kind of put this in the category of the thing that we say, hey, we're just going to sort of hide this over here and not really talk about it, okay? Um, And that is the difference, by the way, between a Baptist and a Methodist. You know the difference between a Baptist and a Methodist? Methodists say hi to each other at the liquor store. (laughs) I'm going to ask the praise team to come up, and we're going to pray. I told you my goal is to keep my job, all right? Well, today, we're going to read a story. I'll give you all a minute if you all need a minute. I had four more jokes, but I'm going I'm to hold off. Today, we're going to read a story of which alcohol is mentioned. Wine is mentioned in this story, the fermented juice of grapes, Now, let me tell you two things the Bible says to us when it comes to the consumption of alcohol. Number one, the Bible tells us don't be a drunkard. We see that in Ephesians chapter 5. The second thing the Bible tells us as it pertains to the consumption of alcohol is don't cause another to stumble in this way. Romans chapter 14. Now, I'm going to leave that there for a sermon for another day, right? Or I'll let the next pastor preach on this subject. Because while this story mentions this very sensitive topic, the story of Jesus' first miracle is not about the use or the misuse of alcohol. It's about something way more important. And it fits into the storyline of this series. What is so epic about this miracle that would point to what Jesus is going to supernaturally do with his death, his burial, and his resurrection? And this miracle points to something really important about Jesus. And so here's what I want to do today just for a few moments. Um, uh, This might be a shorter one than normal, but John chapter 2, we're going to read the first 11 verses of John chapter 2. And so let's read these, and then we're going to unpack it for a little bit. 
It says this, on the third day, and this is just referencing what happened in chapter 1, nothing overly significant here. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Now, uh, we know Jesus' mother to be Mary. She's not mentioned by name here, but this is, this is Mary. And Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman, Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now, six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them, so they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter, and they did. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and he told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first, then after people are drunk, the inferior But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first sign of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you, and we do thank you. And God, as we look at this text, Lord, I do pray today that you'll use it in a way to stir our affection towards you, to remind us where our hope is, to remind us of your life your death, your burial, and your resurrection for sins. Father, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, John records this miracle, and the book of John, if you study the Gospel of John, you'll find that the Gospel of John records the least amount of miracles. As a matter of fact, it, uh, John only records eight miracles of Jesus. But of those eight, six of the miracles are exclusive to John, meaning you're only going to find those miracles recorded in John's gospel. And this is one of those miracles. Some commentators have even alluded to the possibility that this is John's wedding, that he's writing about his wedding, which would mean, or which would be the reason why it's only found in John's gospel. I don't believe that to be true, but some hold that that view. But nonetheless, this is the only gospel out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is the only one that records this miracle of water into wine in Cana of Galilee. This is his first public miracle. And so it's extremely important in the context of our series because in many ways, this is us reading and us seeing that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that has come to live, to die, to be buried, and to be raised to life for the forgiveness of sins. And so it's certainly an epic moment. Now, the location of this is just outside of Nazareth in a place called Cana in Galilee. Galilee would be like the county. Galilee would be uh, sort of the, the province, if you will. And then here is Cana, this small town. Today, if you go to Israel with us, we drive through it pretty quickly. It's, a, it's an Arab town of a population of about 23,000 people. But a real place where this real event Took place. Now, just side note, one of the most important things about the Bible is just how historically accurate it is. The fact that you can go to this town, you can go to this place, continues to point to the validity of our scripture. And so, this isn't some unknown place. This is a real city with real people. This is a real wedding. Jesus has been invited to it, his disciples have been invited to it, and his mother is there. Also, we don't know what her relationship is to the wedding party. We have no idea why they were invited to it. We don't even know who was being married. But nonetheless, it was important that they be a part of the invitation list. It's a Jewish wedding banquet. That makes a difference as it pertains to the reason it's such a big deal. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the miracle itself. You already know what it is. It's turning water into wine. A true Miracle. Taking something and turning it into something else only happens through the sovereignty and the power of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. 
And when Jesus performs miracles, there's a point behind them, and then that there's something he's revealing to the world and to his disciples. I am the Messiah. Now, I will tell you that our Roman Catholic friends, they love this story. Uh, if you were to Google commentaries on the, the miracle at Cana, you're going to find lots and lots of resources that are from the Roman Catholic theological community. They love this story for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is the involvement of Mary. I mentioned a minute ago that Mary is not mentioned by name, but this is, in fact, Mary. The Roman Catholic Church uses this verse to sort of explain her dual role in divine things. That there had to have been moments where Mary had influence over the divinity and the actions of Jesus as her mother, which then for them would elevate her to a position of some authority over Jesus in his human life. And so you can start to see why Mary becomes a really, really big deal in the Roman Catholic world, and they would use verses like this. Mary persuades Jesus to fix the issue. Therefore, she has moments where there's a dual role between her and Jesus in the divine things. Well, we certainly don't hold that view at all. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in just a moment, really, Jesus' response to Mary is indicating the complete opposite of her role being a major role in this story. That there is not a dual involvement in the miraculous activities of Jesus, that Mary doesn't have influence in that way. And so that's one of the big reasons, and of course, no surprise here, another reason is the emphasis on wine, and we'll leave it at that. An important miracle with major theological implications. And I find it interesting that this is the first miracle. No one is healed. No one is raised to life. No physical needs are met. Just a simple action from Jesus to take water, to turn it into Wine. Are you guys okay? Everybody good? I've said wine like 40 times. Some of y'all are starting to sweat. Look at the person next to you and say, you all right? He's got two more hours. We're going to get through this. We've canceled community groups. We're going to stay in here. It's interesting, though, that when you read this story, it would seem as though the only reason Jesus performs this miracle is, number one, for the enjoyment of the wedding guests. I mean, I find it interesting in our relationship with this particular subject and topic, like here is Jesus performing what would seem to be a miracle for the purpose of just the enjoyment of the people there. And of course, we're going to learn another reason why he does it is for the enlightenment of his disciples. This is the reason I felt led to preach through this in this epic series, because this is the moment where the disciples see Jesus for who he is. But it is important, too, to see the other reason behind it, motive behind it, so that the wedding can happen the way these weddings happen, for the enjoyment of the people there. And so here's what I want to do, is I just want to walk through this almost verse by verse, and we're just going to sort of read through it, talk a little bit about it, and I've got four things I want to point towards the end by way of consideration and application. The first thing, let's just go back to it, the problem. Here's the problem with the moment. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him they don't have any wine. Now, what is the problem here? Well, the problem is pretty simple. They ran out of wine. Now, you and I would think, oh, that's not that big a deal. Why is that such a big deal? Surely there's water. There's something else they can drink. Maybe there's some unfermented grape juice somewhere. What would be the problem? Well, in, in a Jewish wedding banquet, this would have been a really big deal in the culture. To run out of wine would have been an embarrassment for the groom and the bride. 
As a matter of fact, it would have been such an embarrassment, it would have stayed with them for a while. You can imagine, just to think through this, of them even walking through the town, and they're like, oh, there, there's John and Susie. Oh, they're the ones that ran out of wine. Okay. It would have been an embarrassment. Imagine today when you go to a wedding. I don't know why you go to weddings, but I've been to a lot of weddings. I've done a lot of weddings. I attend a lot of weddings. And I've gotten to a point in my life where I'm going to a wedding based on what they're going to serve after the wedding. I'm just, hey, hello. I actually wish they would print a menu out and put it in the chair so that you can read it as the wedding is happening, right? What are we going to eat after the wedding? Imagine walking into, say we have a wedding here, and usually we go to the activities building for the, for the after party, if you will. And you walk in, and you're like, oh, man, look, they've got chicken wings. Amen, right? Give me somebody amen that. Chicken wing at a wedding, that wedding's going to make it. They're going to make it. Pick your favorite food, and you're like, oh, I can't wait. When are they going to they gonna say we can eat? And then you go sit at your table, and then you're just waiting, and you're waiting. You're just waiting for somebody to come up and go, okay, guys, go ahead and eat. And you're just waiting. It just seems like forever, right? And all of a sudden, you get in line, and you realize the line's kind of long. You're like, oh, man, I mean, you're counting people's wings. You're like, oh, my goodness, dude. Save some for the rest of us. You know who you are. <laughs> and then you get up there. They're gone. Yeah, worst day ever, right? And now all I'm thinking about is not how awesome the wedding ceremony was. I'm not thinking about how cool the decorations are. I'm like, I cannot believe they didn't have enough wings for everybody, right? Terrible wedding. Their marriage isn't going to make it. I'm going to pray against it. And we're going to move on. No, I'm not. But you can imagine in a real serious way of this culture, this would have been a really, really, really big deal. And so this is the problem, and it seems light, but it's not. It's a matter of embarrassment for this family. And so Mary's involvement is now displayed in verse 3. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. Now, we don't know why she's the one involving herself here. We have no idea what her relationship is with the, the wedding party, with the, the bride and, and the groom here. But nonetheless, she simply goes to Jesus, and this is all she says to him. All she says to him is they don't have any wine. Uh, do you know what the word intimate means? Anybody know what the word intimate means? I didn't know what this word meant, but I was reading a commentary where this word came out and it said, Mary intimated, there's no wine. And I started to think about that. Well, what in the world? I was educated in Louisiana, so that means a whole lot of problems up here cognitively, right? So I go back and here's the definition of intimate, and then I just started to laugh and I thought, that is so true. The definition of intimate is to let someone know what you think or mean in an indirect way. And Mary intimates like only moms do, right? If a mom walks into the kitchen and a mom says simply, the trash is full, you know your response is, sure is. Great observation, babe. Wow, mom of the year there. You know what she means, trash is full, translates, take out the trash, right? Or if you go in, the dog is at the door. Your response isn't, wow, you're right. That, that dog is at the door. This is crazy. Let's get a selfie. Let's take some pictures. This is awesome. No, the dog is out the door translates, take the dog out, right? Well, Mary simply just says to Jesus, they don't have any wine. And Jesus has a response to that. And his response teaches us a transition that has happened with Christ, his mother, his life moving forward, her relationship with him, and in many ways debunks this notion that there's a dual activity or relationship between Mary and Jesus as it pertains to his divine calendar, as it pertains to his divine actions, to the things that he's going to do to point people to his divinity. To show that he really is the Messiah. Now here's what he says in verse 4. 
What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Now, let's pause there for a second. Because you, you probably don't want to respond to your mom with the word woman or your wife with the word woman, right? It's probably not going to go well. And so if you read this at first, you're like, oh, my goodness, Jesus is irritated with his mom. <laughs> his mom is over here being all passive aggressive about the wine. And Jesus is like, woman, what? <laughs> now, we read it. It sounds rude. It's really not. Because what Jesus is going to say to her next, he says, what has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked, my hour, or he asked, he said, my hour has not yet come. He, he's saying to her simply this, I am here for a specific purpose. And my purpose is not to do your will. My purpose is to do the will of the Father. My purpose is not to, to, to sort of operate on a human calendar, but my purpose is to operate on the calendar of God. There's a purpose and there's a plan here. Now, we know this is his, his, his mission. We see it in many verses in the Gospel of John and many other passages across the New Testament, specifically John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So in many ways, this is what Jesus is trying to say and is saying to Mary. He's not doing it in a rude way. He's doing it in a way that will sort of display, I'm not your son, I am your Savior. I am the Messiah, the one that is to come. I am the one that was born to live, to die, to be buried, and to be raised from the grave for the purpose of the forgiveness of sins and the redemption of mankind back to the Father. And so there's a depth here where Jesus is making it clear. Now, clearly, because he's going to perform the miracle, at some point during this exchange, Jesus recognized this was the time, let's go. We don't have all the details here. We don't know what happened on the in-between. But clearly at, at some point, maybe Jesus went away, prayed for a minute, came back and said, all right, let's make this happen. All we know is there's this transition that, once again, just shows Mary to be a mom, I think. But he says, what has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. And then Mary just simply says, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> do whatever he tells you. Told the servants, just whatever Jesus says, you do it. And so then Jesus goes to work. He's now come to this place where he's going to perform this miracle. Now I want you to notice the quantity here, right? Because they've run out of wine. How much wine do they need? This is a really important question. And Jesus kind of gives this miracle a really, really massive amount of quantity when it comes to the, the wine here. Go to verse 6. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Let me say that again. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Verse 7. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them, so they filled them to the brim. Now, we already know the miracle here. The miracle is that the water is going to be turned to wine. There's six stone jars all holding 20 to 30 gallons of water that will be turned into wine. That means when this is all said and done, Jesus turned 120 to 180 gallons of wine, water into wine. Now, if you're asking the question, is that a lot of wine? Yes, that's a lot of wine. I mean, that is a lot of wine. I mean, this is like... Maybe the first Mardi Gras, I don't know. But he, <laughs> I don't know why. A lot of wine. The quantity is massive. 
Surely, sure. I mean, just imagine at, at, at minimum there's 180 people there. That means every person at that wedding party gets a gallon of wine. If that's not a lot of wine to you, we, come see me after the service. There's a lot here. This quantity is massive. We don't know how many people were there, but we know they ran out already. Maybe they ran out of, they already drank 180. If that's the case, this is a wedding of weddings of weddings, right? But this miracle is not just about the quantity, it's about the quality. Verse 8, then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. Who's the head waiter? He's the wedding coordinator, if you will. He's the one in charge. He's the one to make sure all the things are going as to plan, to make sure people are happy, to make, people, make sure people are enjoying themselves, to make sure the purpose of this feast and this wedding banquet is met. People are happy. People are having a good time. And they did, verse 9. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then after people are drunk, the inferior, but you have kept the fine wine until now. Meaning he kind of lets us into this sort of trade secret that happened at weddings in, in the first century. That if you go to a wedding, you would set out the good stuff first, and then people would begin to drink it. And they'd go, wow, this is really good stuff. Wow, this is, the, this is the best of the best, really great. And then when people got to a place where they didn't really care anymore, they would do a little switcheroo. They would take the good stuff away, and they'd bring the old stuff in, and no one was none the wiser. But this guy then comes out and says, whoa, man, no one does this. The, this new stuff that you're bringing out, it's, it's the best, You've not done what others have done. You've kept the fine wine until now. You have saved the best for last. And it's a significant point here, and we'll talk about that here in a second. And so you've got this, the quantity of it, you've got the quality of it, and then you get the purpose behind it in verse 11. Jesus did this, the first signs of his signs. The first sign of what? He's the Messiah. He's, he's the one that they've been waiting for. Now, the wedding party, they don't really get that. There's another purpose behind it. Jesus did this, the first sign of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Remember what I said in the very beginning, that the purpose behind this, it seems as though one is just for the enjoyment of the wedding party. Jesus agrees to intervene to fix this problem, that they've ran out of wine. It would be a big deal for them not to have wine. It would be an embarrassment. We don't know Mary's involvement with the wedding party. We just know that Jesus agrees to perform this miracle. And in doing so, it's simply just for the enjoyment of the wedding party. But then it's for the enlightenment of his disciples. That the whole point of him calling the disciples to follow him is so that he would then show them that he really is the Messiah. He would teach them how to live a life as a disciple of Christ and then send them out to tell the world the truth of who Jesus is. All of his miracles have that at its background. All of his miracles pointing to his deity. Yes, to his compassion. Yes, to his mercy. Yes, to his goodness but all for the purpose of pointing to his divinity. And so this is an epic moment leading us towards who Christ is, showing us and putting on display who he is and showing us what he's going to do when he institutes this new covenant at the Last Supper, when he tells the disciples, okay, here we go. I am the bread. I am the wine. Everything that's going to happen to me, my broken body, my blood poured out is for the forgiveness of sins, and you don't need anything else. And so what do we glean from this? Number one, and you can write these down, number one, 
I think we glean from this story, this miracle, is that we're reminded that Jesus is the creator. This is a creation miracle. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, He's created all things, and all things have been created through him, by him, and for him. He is the creator. What's significant about that? He's God in the flesh. He is the Messiah. And this creation, this, this sovereignty, this, this power over the elements of the world are only, only exclusive to our God. And so Jesus is showing in this miracle that his, he's the creator. He's the one that Paul's going to talk about in Colossians. He's the one that was there in the very beginning. When in the beginning God created, Jesus has always been and always will be. The second thing is that Jesus is the purifier. Go back to verse 6 really quick. Verse 6, he brings up these six stones. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jew, Jewish purification. Meaning it, would be not, it wouldn't be uncommon for a Jewish community to have these big stone water jars. They would fill them with water for the purposes of purification. To cleanse themselves on the outside before they were able to do any specific activity. It was a part of their law. It was a part of their rituals to make sure on the outside they were clean. When I was uh, The first time I ever went to Israel, I was on the airplane. Um, and Katie, Katie didn't go with me, and so I was there alone, sitting on this plane, and the guy sitting next to me was a, was a religious Jewish man. And as we started to fly towards Jerusalem, as we were getting over the land of Israel, or Tel Aviv, we were going to Tel Aviv, as we were getting over the land of Israel, he started frantically looking for something. Then he starts patting, and of course I'm getting a little nervous, I'm like, what are you looking for? And then he starts pushing the, the, the button, which we know if you're on the descent, that's a no-no, right? He starts pushing the button, and he asks the, 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 the lady for, for water. And he's like, you know, you don't understand. I have, to cleanse, I have to cleanse myself. I have to cleanse myself. And she's like, sir, this is American Airlines. That ain't how it works, right? And I felt bad for the guy because he really wanted to cleanse himself. And as soon as they landed, or we landed, he hand, she handed him a bottle of water. He put it on his hands and started, walk, you know, started praying. And he had the tassels. He starts rubbing the tassels. What's the point? There's this thing where he feels the need to cleanse himself from the outside. And so you've got these purification pots that are going to be filled to the brim with water. That water is then going to be turned into what? Let's all say it. Wine. And what is wine often associated with in the New Testament? The blood of Christ. When, when you take the Lord's Supper, when we take the Lord's Supper on the last Sunday of every month, the bread represents his body. The juice that we use represents his blood. And I think this is significant here. I think it's significant here because, listen, Cleaning yourself on the outside will never make you clean. You, you can never do enough right on the outside to make you clean enough, if you will, to be right with God. The only way a person is right with God is not to be right on the outside, but to be right on the inside. And the only way a person is right on the inside is to be covered by the blood of Jesus. His life, his death, his burial, his resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. What makes me right before God right now? It's not my outside, but it's what I believe on the inside. And there is no doubt the inside informs what we do on the outside. But as it pertains to your salvation, the only way to be purified and cleansed from all of your sins, past, present, and future, is to put your faith and trust in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. And so we've got this Jesus is the creator. We've got Jesus is the purifier. And, and I wrote this down. Jesus makes everything better. I love this from this story. Jesus just makes everything better better. Invite Jesus to everything in your life and he will make it better. He will make it better. He made this wedding better. 
I, I wonder if they gave him a quantity. He goes, no, no, I'll show you. Let me show you really quick. He makes everything better. In Matthew chapter 15, he, he, he points this out. He, he, takes, he takes quantity, he takes quality, and he, and he gives it to us. And he makes our life better. He makes our marriage better. He makes our, our parenting better. He makes our finances and how we relate to him better. He helps us see the world the way we're supposed to see the world. He helps us be better neighbors and better friends, better coworkers. Jesus makes everything better. Invite him to everything in your life. And one of the things I love about this as we conclude is we see that the best is yet to come. I love this point when he goes to that head waiter and the head waiter goes, man, this is, this is, this is wild. Most people, most people don't bring out the good stuff at the end, but you have. You have saved the best for last. The, the, you've kept the best until now. And that is a Christian perspective that we see. Our perspective on this life is the best is yet to come. Joel Stein wrote a book several years ago. You might remember it, but it's the title, Your Best Life Now. And that's not the biblical perspective. This is not our best life now. The best for us is yet to come. What's waiting for us is, is the best and he's promised us that best. He's promised us for the believer, for the Christian, for those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus, that this is the only hell we'll ever know. This is not our best life. Our best life is yet to come. If you're not a follower of Christ, well, this is your best life now. And Jesus says that's not really the point of it all. This is not our home. The Apostle Paul is going to teach very explicitly that we're strangers and aliens to this place. We're going to see in 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul is going to say, if we have hope only in this life now, we are to be pitied of all people. No, no, we have something better waiting for us. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I see the world, the more I battle with my own inclinations and desires and problems and issues and all the things that you do, the more I long, Jesus, come, Jesus, come. Why? Because I believe the best is yet to come. And so my hope for you that as you think through this, as you consider some of these things, that you'll consider your relationship with Jesus first. As he purified you and you believed in that of all your sins by confessing and repenting? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus and believed in him as the Messiah? Have you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus died and that God raised him from the dead? And in doing so, you are saved. What are those areas in your life where Jesus isn't a part of it, but you know if he were, it would be better? And that you would respond to go, okay, I'm ready to, I'm ready to put Jesus here. I'm ready for Jesus to be important here. I'm ready to go all in with Jesus in every aspect of my life. And be encouraged this morning that the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I do pray today that as we consider this miracle God, that we're just reminded that at every turn we see you proclaiming through actions and activity that Jesus is the Messiah and that we find comfort in that and that we can trust that and that we can see that life is better when it's lived with Christ. Yes, we have issues and yes, we're going to face the trials and tribulations of a broken world. But God, even as we face those things, facing them with you is better. Remind us of that today. And Lord, I pray today if there's any person here that's never put their faith and trust in you, that today will be the day of salvation for them. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
Amen. Let me encourage you this morning. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, we'd love to help you. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to answer questions this morning. You can take that red Connect With Us card. You can fill it out. You can write on the back. I need a pastor or minister to call me. Place it in one of those black boxes on your way out, and we'll call you. Or when we're dismissed here in a little while, I'll be hanging around down front. If you'd like to talk to someone today about what it means to follow Jesus, I'd love to talk to you and help you answer the most important question a person will ever answer, and that's what they believe about Jesus. Amen? Would you stand?